City University Television. In association with the Center for Advanced Study in Theater Arts. And the Harold Plurman Endowment. Presents Spotlight. Welcome to Spotlight. I'm Ed Wilson, and my guest is the distinguished theater critic, Mr. Walter Kerr. Walter, welcome. Thank you, Ed. I want to talk about theater reviewing and theater criticism, but before we get to that, how did you get started in this? How did you become a theater critic? Well, in one sense, it was a kind of deciding that I wasn't any good at anything else. I mean, <laughs> in the theater? Uh, or, or in, in any the theater. Or in Well, uh, I, I, uh, I started out as a, as a kid uh, pa with a passionate fondness for films. I mean, that's what I could get to, you know. Right. Uh, it, where, you grew up where, Walter? In Evanston, Evanston Illinois, Illinois, just outside Chicago, but just an hour away, you know, from where there were theaters. But uh, you've got to be, uh, you know, teenage at least before you can go. Excepting we did have uh, stock companies in, in Evanston, including uh, Ralph Bellamy's uh, company, uh, company yes. uh, when he was the young leading man, you know, just coming up. But you went to a lot of films then, to begin with. Mostly on. film, because that's what mostly there was. Right, right. And uh, so, uh, uh, but then I gradually shifted to, uh, toward, uh, I think it was a, as a result of talking films. As talking films came in, I shifted over to, toward the theater as being a part of the same pattern, same, you know, basic idea, structure. And, uh, but then I didn't know what I was going to do in it. I didn't necessarily want to re review. Uh, so I went to uh, Northwestern's Drama School, where I studied every bloody thing, you know, <laughs> from beginning to end. Acting? Uh... Acting, acting. I decided one thing got out of Northwestern, I decided I couldn't act. Right. I, mean, I, did, I did a lot of it, you understand, yes. but it was... Uh, a dangerous business. But you did yeah. get into directing because uh, yes, uh -huh. once you got on the faculty at Catholic University, which you, uh, how, how long was it between the time when you finished Northwestern and you began teaching at Catholic uh, University? Oh, you know, three months. Three, so you <laughs> went immediately then from Northwestern That's right. to Catholic University in Washington. Yes. And there you did a lot of directing, didn't you? Oh, uh, a tremendous amount, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was doing five, six shows a year at least, you know. And were you, had you begun to write at that point criticism? Oh, yeah, I started, well, no, not criticism. I started to write everything else. I was trying to write for the theater, plays, you see. And I had already done a lot of that at Northwestern. I had published a number of plays by that time, a little short play, yes. you know, uh, and for the amateur market, primarily. That's, for, that's one way you can start. Sure. And, uh, but then I, I gradually, oh, it took a long time because I was at it a long time. I stayed 10 years at Catholic U. And uh, directing, 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 really all of the time. But at the same time, I also got three or four shows on Broadway. Right. And uh, in that same period. One of them was Sing Out Sweet Land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which uh, Burl yeah. Ives was in. I could, That's right. I saw that. Uh, oh, you did? Yes, I Good. did. <laughs> well, of the ones I did, that was my favorite. I was mean, it? It had yes. a lot of folk songs in it, as I recall. It was, it was kind of the, uh, the American theater and American history through its folk music was the idea at that time. Don't you think that, uh, I mean, this is not totally a rhetorical question, but partly all of that work you did as a director and as a writer probably was the best possible preparation for being a critic, would you say? I don't know. I, I've often wondered whether you have to have any of that. I did it because I loved it. I yes. just, I liked every part of the theater. I wanted to know what, how you do every part of the theater. That's why I kept trying things that I wasn't even suited for, you see. <laughs> and, uh, uh, or I didn't know that right away. But I, I gradually gave up uh, directing after I, after I broke away from Catholic U. Uh, and then uh, later on, I broke away from write, trying to write also for the theater and just concentrated on the one thing that was left. What really happened was this, Ed. I, I mean, it's, it, it's hard to believe, I suppose. But um, uh, I, my, Gene and I together yes. had written a musical review that George Abbott produced called Touch and Go. Yes. And uh, it had been, had been running, it worked, it was successful, not a smash by any means, but it was there. Yes. And uh, it was also in, uh, playing in London at the same time for, you know, twice nightly. Uh, but anyway, um, after about four or five months, the show's still running in New York, I'm Catholic U again, and uh, I think, you know, it's a strange thing, but this, this show is a success. And 
I did the directing, and I wrote half of the lyrics, and I wrote half of the sketches, and I did you know, all this sort of stuff. But nobody has, has asked me to do anything else, you know, <laughs> and not a single request from, from the woodwork. And uh, uh, at the same time, I happened to have done one of those Sunday pieces uh, for, uh, for the Times uh, it, about the theater in right. general. They, you know, they often go to academic people yes. and so on and so forth. And so I had, I had um, written a piece for them. The mail on it. Up to here. Oh, really? Yeah. Nothing over here. Nothing about the directing <laughs> not, and not the a uh, thing, not a review thing. writing. This. But, oh, and so I looked at it and I said, yeah, am I crazy? Yes. You know, th apparently this is what I do better. I mean, I couldn't. So you followed the, uh, uh, the indicators clearly that toward doing I thought I should. Yes. <laughs> and then, but of course, uh, then I you. I still loved it all. You, know. you started writing for the Herald Tribune. Yeah. Where you stayed for 15 years as their as their yes. theater critic. Yeah. I start, actually started on Commonweal. You started yes, uh, which was a weekly a weekly yeah. publication. And uh, but after a year, I went to the Tribune. To the Tribune. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, uh, now this is one of the things I want to ask you about because you were at the Herald Tribune for 15 years. Yeah. Then you went to the New York Times, mm -hmm. where you've been ever since. Yeah. I know you officially retired. I'm, in, I'm retired. Uh, yeah, yeah. In 1983, <laughs> but you still write frequently, really, for the New York Times. Yeah. And um, yeah. I consider you, and so do I think most people, still a very active critic. Well, uh, I'm even, freelance. Yes. Yeah, so. But now tell me, I, because I'm sure people would be interested in this. Uh, in those years when you were writing for the Herald Tribune and then later for the Times, as a reviewer, uh, let's just take the process uh, of your going to a show. When you first began, you had to have a review ready that the night in which you saw the show, isn't that correct? Immediately after the show, we used to tear out of the theater. You know, the curtains were still late, 8 or 8.30, and uh, we would tear out of the theater. I would get back to the office and my shirt sleeves rolled up. Uh, let us say mm, 10, 25, something of that kind, and maybe later. Yes. And uh, I had to deliver the copy an hour from that. From so you that. had to write the entire piece in one hour? In one hour, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, now later it got tighter. Let's back up a moment now. When you, you knew going in to the theater mm -hmm. on a given night that you had that deadline to meet. Yeah, we all did. Yeah. Exactly. Everybody Except for the weeklies. Yes. But all the daily newspapers. Uh, well, no, as a matter of actual fact, except for the afternoons. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they had a, and they had Dick more Watts, time. for instance, had until 2 o'clock in the morning to do his. Right. Uh, but I tell you, it's. Uh, <laughs> well, now tell me this. You must have then, uh, what I'm getting to is you must have started thinking about your review as you were almost in midstream, as you were in the, almost in the middle of the show or certainly the moment it was over. Where, how, did this, how did this begin to formulate? As you sat there in the theater uh, with your various impressions that you were getting, were you already beginning to think about your approach to this, to writing about it? Sure, you had to. You had, there was no other way to do it. Right. What I used to do was, I, for notes, I would take two sheets of yellow paper, tear them uh, into f four parts, and fold them together. And then I would reserve one page for each thing I might be talking about. Might be. Right. The front of this little, you know, scratch paper here uh, were possible leads, because that's you know you're, you're so stuck if you haven't got a lead when you get back to the office you got to go. Right. You could maybe do the, all the stuff about the acting, but if you haven't got that lead up front, you're you're in trouble already. I think uh, let's just <laughs> stop there for one second because I I don't think people who have ever done this have any idea how important the first sentence and mm. the point of attack is for a, an article for a review or an article. Yeah. I mean it. It, it, I, I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's really the key to getting into it and getting the momentum to write the piece, don't oh, you? Oh, yes. If you have what you think is an acceptable lead that will work for you, and by work I mean produce a second paragraph, a third paragraph, a fourth paragraph, logically speaking. Yes. You know, does it, does it breed? Right. <laughs> in effect. And <coughs> also, I think, don't you agree, has to point, uh, not only breathe, that's what you mean, carry you through, but yeah. it also has to focus on the area that you think is important, Most important. to call attention to, whether yeah. it's, if it's a new play, how well the play works, yeah. or if it's got a well-known actor in it, how well Start that with actor, him. Sure. Uh, yeah. how well the actor performs. Mm -hmm. So you had these four pieces of paper, <laughs> and one with a four... Uh, well, it gave you, what, eight or eight more, sides, more yeah. views. Yeah. Yeah. So and you so had one was for a possible lead. Right, that was, that was up front. Yes. And uh, then... Uh, Oh, after that, it would depend on the show, of yes. course. Uh, I had a middle section, the, middle, the, the centerfold, uh, 
which I just labeled stuff. And stuff meant color. I mean, that is to say. The scenery. Scenery, odd scenery. You see, now the, the, I mean, were there gar gargoyles peering in at the window? What, what, what's going on here? Uh, what, how brilliant are the colors, literally right. colors yes. on the stage, if they are, or if not? And if not, why not? And so forth. Um, Would stuff also include, for instance, a, an actor in a small part who was out, who happened to if catch your good, eye? If yes. he, yeah, if he was worth that kind of attention, uh, then by all means, let's give it to him. That's where the next star will come from. You know? Right. Yeah. So, all right, so stuff was a section then. Yeah. What were the other sections then? <laughs> well, uh, let's say there were two leading actors, you know, yes. uh, and, and, and they were important actors. Yes. Uh, well, well, you've got Lynn Fontaine and uh, Alfred Lund on your hands or whatever. Uh, you'd have to have a page for each of them. Yes. Notes, just yes. things they do, how they looked, tricks they played, so forth. And uh, then uh, uh, in the back of the book, let's say, uh, it, uh, you'd have your scene designer take care of that. And uh, lighting and um, anything else. What about language sometimes. Language yes, Where quotes. would you put, the, for example, in this scheme, which already gave you a sense of organization? Yeah. In other words, you went in with a certain sense of organization. Uh, as you the, hoped. You mm -hmm. hoped, yes. Yeah. Well, but you had categories in any case. Uh -huh. Where yes. would you put the play if it was a new play? How would the structure and the... Well, the, if it's a good one or a bad one, you know, yes. it all depends. If it's a good new play, way up front, I mean, you would try to get, get it into the lead if you could do I it. I see. In other words... If it was more important than the, the actors in this case. Would you, uh, even as you went into a, for example, if you were going to see a new play by Tennessee Williams, mm -hmm. and of course you were writing when many of these were opening and played. Yeah, I, I missed Menagerie. I wasn't right. there for yeah, that. I, know. I saw it, of course. Yeah, sure. And I missed Streetcar. Yes, but, but you saw uh, all the rest. Yeah. Cat and Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and yep. Night of the Iguana and a whole group there. Sure. Or mm -hmm. a play by Arthur Miller or what have you. Or, and of course you were writing when the plays of O'Neill came along, like Long Day's Journey and Tonight, which had not been... Well, the play of... Oh, no, no, as a matter of actual fact, I guess there were three or four of them. That's right. Fact, my favorite, The Moon for the Misbegotten, yes. was, was in that group. And I so, saw that three times, I think. So you were able to review those. Now, when you had a play by someone like Eugene O'Neill or Tennessee Williams, uh, clearly, I would think going in, you knew that the play was going to be of primary importance in the review that you were going to write, wouldn't you? Or, or is that... You don't know absolutely. You don't know anything absolutely <laughs> when you walk right. in a, with that one hour, you know. But you have ideas about what it might be. That's all. Did you, I assume, that you, when you went to the theater on any given night, and of course in those days you went three or four nights a week. Yes. I, I mm -hmm. mean, you really went frequently because there were many more openings in the 50s, 60s, and so forth than there have been in recent yeah, years. Yeah, when, when I began, I think there were about 90 Broadway openings. There was no off-Broadway yes. at that time. But uh, there were about 90 off-Broadways every season. Uh, and it just started s slipping down, 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 down yes. from there. I sometimes wondered if it was my fault. You, know. well, <laughs> you mean because of critical it reviews? It just coincided. But with, uh, <laughs> well, I think uh, there were so many things. Of course, off-Broadway started to come up. As Broadway that went happened down. within a year or two. Yeah, oh, Summer and Smoke uh, was, was the came, came along. You know, catalytic and agent there, and Brooks Atkinson. Yes. Uh, uh, nobody went off Broadway because there were a few houses off Broadway, but they didn't have the professional uh, sheen that, that they that developed, they developed that later. And um, when when you went though to the theater on, to see those ninety Broadway shows, or I presume you tried to you went each night with as open a mind as possible, with as few mm. preconceptions as yeah. possible, in yeah. terms of the writers, the actors, everybody else. Did you, you can't cause a race uh, if you've seen a fine, if you've seen Ethel Merman or whoever it happens mm. to be, you can't erase your memories of that no. person. But presumably you went each time with uh, as few preconceptions as possible. No, that's right, yes. Yeah. And then the, as you were watching it, the impressions came to you and you gradually form this review uh, from these categories and these lines and these impressions. Yeah, but to me, it seemed to me important that, uh, that you see it as the audience sees it. Uh, in other you words, never read a new play, in other words, ahead of God. Never, never, never. I wouldn't do it. I mean, right. I think it'd be so fatal. if you were going yeah. back to see a Shakespeare, would you read it again or would you wait to see the production? Well, I tell you, I didn't know the answer to that question, so I found out. <laughs> now, this is, <laughs> the first year I was on the Herald Tribune, Along came Olivier and, uh, <laughs> and his wife, 
in uh, the, that double Shakespeare Caesar thing. Caesar and Cleopatra and Anthony and Cleopatra. 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 Yes. Cleopatra. And uh, I thought, you know, I haven't read the Shakespeare, uh, Anthony, in a long time. I mean, it's a long time, six, seven, seven years maybe. I better take another look. And so I did. I, I read that one before I went in. And in my review, among other things, I, I complimented the actors on the absolute clarity, vigorous clarity of their speech. <laughs> and I got this kind of pack of letters again, a you know, different sort. Uh, they, they, I was excoriated. I mean, they, what do you mean? Why, we couldn't hear them at all in row, you know, G-H-I, whatever it was. But because you had read it ahead of time, yeah, knew you knew what, what it was. the words were. <laughs> yeah. And so if you'd gone without having read it, you probably would I not... I probably would have made note of the fact that they weren't as clear as they might have been. Isn't that so? Whether it was the house or the company or... Exactly. Whatever. So from then on, you never read... Never did it again. <laughs> so whether it's a, a revival then or a new play, you never read the script ahead of time. No. <laughs> Just to follow through a bit on the process we were talking about in those days, when you got back to the office of the Herald Tribune and then later the New York Times, you had these notes. You were probably thinking all the way in the taxi or walk or however you got back to the office of exactly how you would approach this, I presume. You were already starting to compose the review in your mind? Sure. You, you know, you, you've got maybe two other people, three, four people in the cab with you if you happen to t get the same cab that Brooks Atkinson and his wife got, you know, and I had Gene was with me. And they're all yak, 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 and they're talking away, and you're sitting there trying to figure out, what is the first sentence, you know? <laughs> uh, yes. Now, when you were writing that one hour, that had that one hour to write, did you have any chance to revise? Did you have to just make it right the first time? Yeah, you had to make it whatever it was going to be the first time. That is to say, uh, you no, had no opportunity. Well, if you want to hang around uh, until uh, trouble is the, the if you hung around that after after uh, getting your copy in, it probably was already too late. I mean, I by see. the time it went down there, uh, the presses were starting to roll. You know, the, the other sections maybe had been printed. They're waiting for you, and uh, so you couldn't even afford to be late. Uh, in fact, that's one of the, one of the things that, that, um, that happened to me that, that helped me a lot. Uh, was the pressure of this? Or? Well, I'm just going to say that I used to fret about it terribly, and I started to also be a little late. You know, oh, I see. A minute, four minutes, whatever, you know. And Al Davies, who was the night copy ant man, uh, said to me, he said, I, listen, you're, you're, you're late, you're getting later with this stuff. Now watch it, watch it carefully, you know. And so finally, we came along to another time where we're about seven, eight minutes late, you know. And so Al just sent the paper with the review incomplete, oh. half, half the review. Oh, really? Yeah. To, to teach you a lesson, I guess. And I you know what? I felt marvelous about it. Really? Because the worst that happened, I didn't lose my job. I, <laughs> so from then on. <laughs> the earth didn't, you from know, the didn't, sky didn't fall. Exactly. Really, you know? Well, now tell me, uh, because of course now the process is different. Uh, yeah. You are not doing daily reviewing and haven't for some time, but for those who are, uh, they see a preview, and they have anywhere, sometimes they have two days to write. The yeah, review. that changed all in, in about the period that I was uh, going from the Herald Tribune to, to the, the Times because the, the Tribune had fallen apart. And do you, how do you feel about the pros and cons of those two types of reviewing? Uh, do you think it's better now than it was when you were under that time pressure? Well, I, I think a, it's a good idea to have a, some more time. I think a few reviewers might be helped. By that pressure? They, they could be. They could be. Uh, you see, it gives you an awful lot of energy. I mean, you, you come out of the theater, if, it's, if the show is any good, uh, with, with your energy, you're, you're filled up with it. You're, you want to talk about it. Right. There's a if lot of adrenaline. If you were a reviewer, you'd yes. be out there talking to the next man on the sidewalk or your wife or somebody, you know? And uh, that, that was marvelous, I think. Uh, but uh, I also think at the same time that um, uh, if you have to, if you are forced uh, to, to do it at this particular rate of speed and have to go with it, as we were starting to, to say, uh, whatever it happened to come out, I think you can misrepresent yourself. You, there's a danger that you may not get the shape the way you wanted it. Or and then the, that's going to still be there as right. your opinion, as the paper's opinion. Right. You know? Or the emphasis or whatever in yeah. terms of that yeah, time. Yeah. Now, of course, one uh, possibility you had, though, in those days was a weekly follow-up. You could write mm -hmm. a piece that came out on Sunday a week or two later that 
you really in yeah. which you could perhaps uh, make some adjustments uh, in terms of any kind of... Yeah, you could clear it up a little clear bit. Clear it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, now, but I'm assuming... Uh, well, well, you had to be very careful about not wanting to seem to take it all back. Not to second-guess yourself. Yeah, right. Well, let me ask you this, though, because this must have... I'm sure people have asked you this many times. Have you very often in all these years really changed your mind? I mean, did you, with that, that first impression... Uh, did you later have a different feeling or uh, about it, or was was be that usually hard. what you were willing to stand by? Yeah, be very hard to change your opinion. I, I don't know how you can do it exactly. Yes, at, at least within a short period of time, like the next day right. or the uh, next week. You know, I don't think that would happen because you still have that that first image so strongly implanted in your mind that that's, that's the way you would see it. Right. You know? And, uh, so whether you like... No, I think you, maybe you could look, you could pick up some of your old copy uh, two years hence and say, good God, why did I say things like that, you know? Uh, but that's, that's more time. Yes. A lot more. So you think that really in terms of this question of having uh, an hour or an hour and a half and two days really would not make an, a difference really in terms of how you viewed it, whether you thought it was a worthwhile play or not, a successful play, a successful performance... No, would no, remain I, very much the same. Right, I, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then, when I, let, me, let me ask you something, because you've, uh, we've talked about how reviewing has changed in terms of, of the conditions. What about the theater? Because uh, you've watched it through all of these years. What are the sort of, do you think, the changes that you've seen take place, the most significant changes, between uh, when the time when you started in, with the Herald Tribune in 1951 and now? Um, well, in the, in the quality or the character? Well, the quality of the, play. Or the character, both, really. Uh -huh. The kinds of drama we have and the conditions under which it's now presented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, by the time, of course, when I started, you see, we were back in a kind of dead, dead end realism, I would say. Yes. Where, uh, <laughs> the, where the furnishings were the furnishings, where everything was absolutely real, where the, the doors locked, and et cetera, et cetera. They cook meals on the stove. Right, right, right. And, and you know, Batten, Belasco, or uh, other people uh, did all kinds of crazy things. Uh, bought, a whole, bought out a whole child's restaurant and put it on the stage, you know. Bought a rooming house. Moved the, the actual walls, you know, put them on the stage. Well, there wasn't much sense in all that. Uh, but, uh, and even if it was well-designed realism, uh, it's, um, it, it kind of puts a slow time clock not very exciting, you know. It came about, I think, because uh, we were so absorbed with the uh, principles of uh, heredity and environment at that particular time. This is what we had been dealing with, uh, and, and so we wanted to see the environment on the stage. You know? And we put it there, and sometimes it was too much you know, for, the, for the play. Um, it hasn't, the theater has not changed radically. You could still do that kind of a play today. Yes. In fact, you, if you look around, you you'll see find it. some. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I do think this, that Tennessee Williams, above all, helped us to see a way to begin to make that very thing poetic. In other words, uh, how to find a language uh, that would be intensely real and even gutter language and at the same time elevate it. Yes. To, uh, so it became a kind of heightened realism, yes. an extended realism, yeah. mm -hmm. which really opened up a lot of bounds, a lot of doors, really, for what well, came out. opened up the sets, as a matter yes, of fact, literally. Yes, yes you know. exactly. Uh, I mean, take, take the set for a Streetcar Named Desire, that uh, the first thing you see, well, it's not the first thing, but almost the first thing you see, is Blanche coming down this incline, this ramped street outside uh, toward the, the house where she's going to find her sister. And uh, Blanche is, 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 is coming down there, and what coming down there? How, she's on the outside. She's out on the street. But we make the, make the whole thing transparent right? so that we can see her at the same time in a shadowy way, in a ghostly way. But she's there, and we don't understand what we're looking at. Uh, and that means that we've walked right through that wall. That's good. <laughs> what, uh, how did you feel, coming back to the reviewing for just a moment, how did you feel? You mentioned a, a moment ago that maybe you had some influence. I know you were being facetious uh, on the, yeah. <laughs> the, the change from a certain number of plays to fewer today. How did you feel in terms of criticism, in terms of um, criticizing a play or a playwright or an actor? Uh, did you feel that this was simply what you were supposed to do? I mean, what your, 
job called for to be as analytical and critical as you could? Do, were, were you thought mindful of someone's career or anything like that, or did you think that was irrelevant? You've got to, you've got to tell yourself that those things are irrelevant. It's not, that's not what the audience is seeing. That's not what the audience paid good money for. That's not what it the gave its evening for, you see. So you've got to try to make it all, all of those things irrelevant and uh, brush them aside as best you can. Uh, maybe you can't sometimes, you know. But, uh, but you, you really must. Uh, In other words, you must judge the artwork, the performance, the design mm. on its own terms. Yeah. And, and that's your first obligation. Let me, ask, let me ask you another question that people, I think, ask reviewers frequently, and that is in terms of who you were writing for. Did you have a hypothetical audience or reader that, who you were writing for? Were you writing for yourself or an imaginary reader, or did, did that ever enter your mind? Well, I think I can't define it very, very well. That is to say, it's something and somebody out there. It's not for yourself. Uh, oh, probably in ways that you can't escape. It is because you've got to do it. Sure. Uh, but uh, I think it's, no, it is, you, you're trying to tell somebody else, you see. And uh, who that somebody else is, I don't know. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't really know. It's, it's, it's everybody, because look at all the, di the diversity you have and people yes. sitting out front. Um, so uh, they become a composite. I presume they, they're an, an intelligent you assume they're intelligent, you assume they must love the Oh, uh, yeah. The I, in fact, they wouldn't be going to theater that often or reading it, you know, about it at breakfast or on the train if, if they didn't care. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, of course, theater is something that anyone reading your work realized you cared about a great deal, mm. which I think made all the difference. Walter, I hate to say it, but our time is up. Oh. And on that yeah. note, I want to thank you so much for being with us. This has been Spotlight, and my guest has been the theater critic, Walter Kerr. Thank you for being with us.